<laughs> Go ahead. Um, okay, so hi everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's SEDS Online webinar. We're really happy that you could join us today. Um, we want to first of all thank IAS for the sponsorship, which helps help um, helps us give all of these different things um, to you for free. So we have recorded lectures, learning tools, and even virtual field trips on the website. Um, so make sure and check it out. Today we're going to have a lecture by Axel Munica, who's a professor for paleontology at the Friedrich Alexander University of Erlangen in Nuremberg, Germany. Axel received his diploma and his PhD from the University of Kiel before doing four different postdocs in Kiel, Bremen, Lille, and Tübingen before he moved over to Erlangen. And Axel's research really spans different realms of science from sedimentology to paleobiology and even um, goes into some hydrothermal systems as well. And today it made me really happy to hear, uh, Axel told me that his scientific heart beats for carbonates, as mine does as well. I'm super excited to hear this talk. And um, today he's going to tell us a little bit more about carbonate mud and microspar transformation. And with that, Axel, I will give you the mic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my talk will be about the transformation from carbonate mud to microspar. And I will deposit this PowerPoint presentation at the uh, teaching uh, repository here at the SETS online homepage. So if you want to uh, re-digest it, you are welcome to download it. It's not there yet, but I will send it today or, or tomorrow morning. So you, sorry, oops. Um, yeah, so I'm sure many of you have heard the fantastic talk of Sam Perkis on modern shallow water carbonate mud and also Teresa's talk on the fossil counterparts in this SETS online seminar. And what I'm going to do today is I would like to bridge the gap between these two talks, trying to convince you that microspar somehow is the bridge between modern carbonate muds and the fossil counterparts. Okay. And funny enough, it was already folk who invented the term microspar, who recognized that there is a, uh, a link between uh, Teresa's talk and, 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 and the modern carbonate muds. So this is from, the, uh, from folks' publication. He recognized there is a gap between micrite and microspar somewhere around four or five micrometers. And uh, the data takes on great significance or greater significance when it is realized, I have to close this window, that all samples in this secondary peak at five to six micrometers and all those with recrystallized muds, microspar coarser than that occur from a particular class of limestones. This means those associated with shaley interbeds. And that was the topic of Teresa's talks a couple of weeks ago, basically limestone marl alternations in its broadest sense. And it was folk who recognized that the limestones in such sequences consist of microspar. So I will explain in a second what microspar is. Oops, sorry. So if you, for, of course, the first thing you normally do is you look, uh, ask uh, Google, what is microspar? And this is an answer that I got this uh, today. Uh, microspar is a form of neomorphosed micrite with very small crystals. Okay, it's not very informative, it's very brief. So what I would like to show is a um, thin section. So this is a very nice thin section here, actually with different bioclasts. We have low magnesium bioclasts here, the brachiopode shells, and I will use the laser pointer, oops. No, so we have brachiopode shells and bryozoans and a nice trilobite fragment here, low magnesium calcite fossils. We have echinoderm fragments here, uh, high which are composed primarily of high magnesium calcite. And we have aragonitic fragments of aragonitic bioclass, I don't know, bivalve or gastropods, hard to say, and they are completely replaced by calcite spar. But this is not the topic of my talk today. I would like to talk about what's in between these bioclass. And it doesn't look very appealing. It's the, the, it's the mud, the lithified mud, basically. And I will zoom in a bit, whoops. So what happened? I'm not sure. Ah, okay, good. So I will zoom in here in this triangle. And this is how it looks at a higher magnification. It's 100 micrometers here. And it's still not very appealing. It looks a bit grainy. 
No, we have the echinoderm fragment here to the left. And I will zoom in even more and it doesn't change significantly. It's, I would say, even less appealing. It looks a bit grainy. And even in the SEM, if you look at such rocks in the scanning electron microscope, it's not the same sample, but a similar one. This is how it looks like. And uh, what, what do we see? We see crystals that are well, the interlocking. So it, it looks like a puzzle. All these crystals, they fit together like a puzzle. And of course, we cannot deposit a puzzle. So it is, I think it's evident that all we see here is somehow diagenesis. We don't really see anything of the original carbonate sediment anymore. It's recrystallized somehow. And this is long for uh, known for a long time. And oops, for example, this is from a paper uh, that is all 30 years ago from Mosier. He already uh, wrote that uh, lithification involves a dramatic reorganization of material and pore space. The problem is to reconstruct how, when, where, and why lime muds became the product we see today, which basically means we hardly know anything. It's really uh, difficult to reconstruct what has happened if you see something like, like this. And, oops, I'm not sure when this... Okay, this is the model that is until today in most textbooks. It's um, a little bit simplified what Folk has published in 65 in his seminal work. According to his uh, work, Mycrite... Um, grows to microspar by a grading neomorphism, which basically means that the bigger crystals can, are cannibalizing the, the smaller ones. So the bigger crystals get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the smaller ones, they disappear. So micrite, by definition, a grain size between one and four micrometers, uh, real, real, turns into microspar, which has an average grain size of around 10 micrometers, but uh, an overall grain size between five and 30. Uh, so this is until today in, in the textbooks. And how does it look like in thin section? This is a micrite, a planktic foraminifera here and micrite. And they have these, these two pictures have the same magnification. Micrite really is black. We see some tiny little bioclasts here, but the rest is black. Whereas microspar looks always a bit, a bit grainy almost a bit silty, so, okay. Also, folk, it was folk who already recognized how important the magnesium calcium ratio of the fluids is for uh, diagenesis. And we, the, the magnesium calcium ratio of, of uh, marine waters and hypersaline waters is of course very high. So, and we have fresh water and poor water that has low magnesium calcium ratio. So in terms of uh, magnesium calcium ratio, I would say fresh water and, and poor water um, are almost indistinguishable. There's, there, so there's a gap here somehow. And looking at the cements that are precipitated during diagenesis, we see the same gap here in marine waters. We have our typical aragonite needles, fibers, high MC cements, elongated cements. Whereas on the, on the left-hand side, we have more this sort of granular blocky calcite crystals precipitating, for example, from fresh water, but also from poor water. And also microspar is mentioned here on the left-hand side with some question marks. So this is where folk puts or the, put it the microspar. Okay. Most fine-grained carbonate rocks, as so micritic or microsporitic rocks, are lithified carbonate muds, which means they originally had a very high initial porosity and a very high, a very low initial permeability. So a lot of water inside, but a very low permeability. The amount of water could easily uh, exceed 50%, 50, 60, sometimes 70%. And most of these rocks, I'm not speaking about the pelagic oozes, but most of these shallow water, more or less shallow water carbonates, they are lithified without mechanical compaction. This is visible, for example, here in these biotopation traces. This is something like a centimeter here in diameter. And depending on how you cut the trace, you can get perfectly spherical or slightly ovoid um, sections through this biotopation traces. 
indicating that there is no mechanical compaction. It's even nicer visible here in these organic walled microfossil. It's an acritarch here. These fossils are very susceptible to compaction. It's very easy to compact these organic walled fossils. They have very thin walls, but in limestones, they are pre preserved three dimensionally. But it, what does it mean? If we turn a carbonate mud, a water filled mud into a limestone without compaction, it means we have to replace the pore water by calcium carbonate cement. Or in other words, these rocks are calcium carbonate importers. And this, <laughs> this is important, <laughs> in fact. Okay, oops. So, and this was, it's also uh, not new, it was known long before. Robin Bathurst, for example, in, in, in one of his papers, Problems on Lithification in Carbonate Muds, wrote that the central difficulty is tantalizingly familiar how to cement a carbonate mud while it is still largely uncompacted. Where was the source of such an enormous quantity of calcium carbonate? And it's really an enormous quantity because it means 50% or even more of, of, of a micritic rock is imported calcium carbonate cement. So where does it come from and why? Oops, okay. Looking at modern carbonate sediments, uh, it, I think it's well evident that they, this story becomes a bit more complicated. These are pictures from Eberhard Gischler from, from Frankfurt and colleagues showing some, some modern carbonate muds. And it's not just, I would say, micrite as um, in, in folks reconstruction. It's, it's quite a diverse um, composition. We have aragonite needles, we have nanograins, they can be calcitic and aragonitic. We have uh, sometimes diatoms. Here is, I think this is a coccolid, it's probably Emiliania Huxley. Uh, I'm not an expert here, but so very, uh, a diverse composition. So, and this was, what the hell, oops. Yeah, oh, this was also known by, by Folk, of course, and he updated his model uh, nine years later. So this is also by Folk. We have the marine ooze here on the left-hand side and microspar on the right-hand side. And what he thinks has happened is the first step in diagenesis, something like a miracle occurs. So the marine ooze is transformed to micrite, microcrystalline calcite, low magnesium calcite. The magnesium calcite components have released the magnesium to the pore water. So it's basically in the pore water now. Aragonite crystals have somehow transformed. It doesn't really explain how. And when this um, magnesium ions that are in the pore water are removed by fresh water, so we have a pore water of low magnesium uh, content, it recrystallizes to microspar. So um, this is the same thing. We have our modern um, carbonate, shallow water carbonate ooze here from the platform. And this is our fossil counterpart. And this model tries to explain the uh, diagenesis here from left to right. But thinking of it carefully uh, gives us some questions or problems. One is fresh water. The model of folk requires freshwater flushing. And freshwater flushing is uh, as a, well, I would say it's the exception rather than the rule because the normal fate of a carbonate sediment is, is downwards, not, not upwards. So it's covered with sediment, covered with more sediment and goes downwards. Freshwater does occur, of course, especially during the uh, very pronounced Pleistocene sea level drops, but otherwise is, is more the exception rather than the rule. Another problem is we do have these sediments, chalk, for example. Uh, chalk is composed of uh, fragments of uh, coccolids, coccolithophores, and is basically a micrite, so low magnesium calcite crystal with um, a very f a small grain sizes. And even when the pore water is filled with fresh water, is that, is, it does not recrystallize to microspar. So this is sort of a problem. Chalk stays chalk for 
for a long time, even if it is buried uh, one or two kilometers, you can still use chalk writing on the blackboard. This is something that you cannot do with a proper microspar. So these rocks do exist, but they don't recrystallize. This is um, from a, um, a figure from a paper of Strandedal 2007. It's just an example. It shows that this chalk still has a significant number of uh, porosity, significant amount of porosity. We have coccolids, some are still recognizable, others are completely disintegrated. Uh, so this is not a microspar, not at all. So, oops. Where does the cement come from is another question. If you, if you look to on the left-hand side here, this is a marine ooze. So everything between the grains is water. The microspar has hardly any porosity left. So we have to import calcium carbonate cement, but without compacting the sediment, it, so it requires an external source. Folk was aware of it, but he, he did not, or he wasn't able to provide an answer. And this is a significant question. How can we turn a soft mud into a solid rock without compaction? I will come to this later. Um, and another problem is when we look at the boundaries between components, especially low magnesium calcite components and the microspar, they are extremely sharp. I will show this in a figure now. This is a tiny little fossil. It has just maybe 15 micrometers in, in, in diameter with a nice shell. By the way, this is uh, from the Silurian. So it's almost half a billion years old, more than 400 million years old. And we can still see the crystals of, this, of the shell. And it is somehow swimming in microspar. We have huge, well, huge, huge microspar crystals. And the boundaries between the shell and the crystals are really sharp. So if the, the microspar would be the result of a, a grading neomorphism of one crystal fighting against the other, the bigger ones growing on the expense of the smaller ones, why did these crystals stop right at the shell? And why didn't these crystals join the game? They should also start to recrystallize, but obviously, they didn't. And so this does not. Re this observation does not really fit to the model of folk. Okay, so now we have a um, sort of a problem. If microspar forms without fresh water, without pressure, and no evidence for cementation at the seafloor, because we would expect marine cements, the only, oops, the only area that uh, where microspar could have been formed, at least in, in, in large amounts, is the so-called shallow marine burial diagenesis. And this is a zone that is sometimes even not even mentioned in, in textbooks, but it's probably extremely important. There are several papers from Leslie Melim, Peter Swart, and, and other colleagues, and Hildegard Westphal, John Reimer, and, and, and more, even more colleagues, working on this shallow marine burial zone. What is so special about this, this zone? Oops. It is decoupled from seawater. So it's very shallow subsurface, few meters probably, few tens of meters maximum, I would say, below the uh, sediment surface. But it's decoupled from seawater because it's carbonate mud with a very low permeability. So it was buried with seawater, but it's not connected to the seawater after deposition. It's decoupled from fresh water. Pressure doesn't really play a role because it's in the very shallow uh, subsurface. The temperature don't play a role because it's basically the temperatures of the sea, uh, sea, sea bottom. But the poor water is very special in this area. It's anoxic. The water is usually quickly consumed by the bacterial decomposition of, of organic material. And it shows um, very different zones. I'm not an expert on organic geochemistry. So please do not ask me questions about this figure. It's from a, a quite recent papers on fossil Lagerstätten. But I like it very much because it shows nicely that we have very different zones of different bacteria using different 
pathways of decomposing the organic matter. First, using the free oxygen, then reducing iron or, or nitrate. And in marine settings, the sulfate reduction zone is extremely important, the methanogenesis zone, and so on. And it means the, the normal fate of a sediment deposited here on the sea bottom it is downward. So every sediment that wants to be turned into a proper limestones somehow penetrates all these zones on, a, on its way downward. And this is where diagenesis happened. But I'm, as I said, I'm not a geochemist, organic geochemist. I'm more, I'm coming from the petrographic side. And these, this is data from, um, from the drill core Clino that was drilled by colleagues from Miami. And the isotopic signature here shows that the uppermost, let's say 150 meters maybe, are influenced by meteoric diagenesis. This is due to the Pleistocene regressions, the glacial sea level drops, and this is nicely reflected in the stable isotope signature. So we have a problem finding modern counterparts because the, the very shallow water, the sediments on the beach or on the platform, they have experienced freshwater diagenesis. So if we want to find as recent as possible counterparts that have not experienced mete uh, meteoric diagenesis, we have to so, uh, investigate samples underneath this zone. And we have examined together with uh, Leslie Mellon and Peterswood and so on, some of these samples here from these two intervals, and Hildegard Westphal. And uh, I will show you the next pictures that I will show now are from these two intervals. The first one is actually a, a recent sediment. So this is how a sediment on the Bahamas uh, looks like more or less. It's basically composed of aragonite needles. And as we have learned uh, in, in this seminar, many of them precipitated from whitings, others from the decay of green algae. Here are some tiny little dolomite crystals, which might be the result from unmixing of high magnesium calcitic components. I don't know how to say, but most of it is, is aragonite needles. So this is a fluffy water-filled uh, aragonite dominated mud. And if we look uh, closer, this is an echinoderm fragment. And this is, um, and we still see the open pores. So the, the, the internal porosity of this echinoderm fragment, the stereome structure. So it's not cemented at all. Normally these pores are filled syntactually with cement. But when we look at the uh, actual skeleton, we see all these tiny little white dots. And these white dots are micro dolomite inclusions. And this means this high magnesium calcitic echinoderm fragment uh, unmixed into low magnesium calcite and micro dolomite inclusions. And this obviously happened very early. Uh, and uh, stabilized this, this skeleton. So low magnesium calcite is stable, dolomite is stable. And if we look at thin sections, high magnesium calcitic fossils, such as echinoderms and coralline algae, they are usually well preserved. They are normally not dissolved, whereas aerogenetic fossils are basically always dissolved. And so that's probably the reason why. So very, very early and unmixing of high magnesium calcitic components to low magnesium calcite and dolomite. Okay. And this is a weakly lithified sediment from the Clino core. And it looks a bit clotted. And if we look at these, these clots, we, see, we still see the aragonite needles. And actually these, these clots are calcite crystals. So inside of this fluffy water-filled aragonite dominated needle mud, calcite crystals start to grow and they grow bigger than the aragonite needles, which means the aragonite needles are incorporated in the growing calcite crystals, poikilotopically or poikilitically. And this continues until these crystals reach each other. 
So now the cementation is completed. The crystals cannot grow any further because they reach each other. But we see the aragonite needles. They are all in, sticking inside these calcitic crystals. And this already resembles our microspar. So what would be the next step? Or it's the dissolution of the aragonite needles and our microspar crystals will get some of these, these pitted structures, these empty pits, which are probably enlarged here a bit by the acid we have used, because these are etched samples, but we have microspar crystals with empty pits. This is still from the clinocore, so pliocene and H. Another from the same core, we see shell, two shells here, it's probably an ostracode shell, I'm not totally sure, but we see very sharp boundaries between the shell and the surrounding pitted microspar crystals because they were basically growing until they reached each other and until they reached a shell. So this is Pliocene Bahamas. And this is half a billion years older. This is Silurian of Gotland. And we see the same thing. We see crystals that have a pitted structure, microspar crystals, some clay minerals are sometimes engulfed here in, in, in these crystals. The shell preserved, the sharp boundaries are now, I think, more easy to explain. Interesting is that the inner part here of this fossil doesn't show this pitted structure. And this makes sense because if this pitted structure is resulting from the dissolution of aragonite needles, there were no aragonite needles inside this spherical fossil. It was just empty, water-filled, and this was a water-filled mud, needle mud. Okay. And looking at another example, this is an ostracode shell here on the right-hand side. The shell is actually very thin. Here is an, a blow-up on the left-hand side. This is the shell. We see the pitted microspar crystals on the left-hand side. And we see normal calcite spar, sparite here filling the ostracode. So in thin section, this would look like our grainy microspar. And this would be translucent, bright translucent, because it's just calcite spar. And if we look at the left-hand side, the crystal size is not really significantly different. Look at this crystal here. It's a very large microspar crystal. It's the same or is even larger than this sparite crystal here inside the fossil. And this is another ostracode shell here, again on the right-hand side, and it was filled with sediment. So it's a geopetal structure. So the lower part here was filled with sediment. The upper half was just clear calcite spar. And if we zoom in here a bit, oops, this is how it looks like. This sediment the part of the filling that has been, or the, the part of the ostracode that has been filled with sediment is now pitted microspar. So probably there was just aragonite needles, or aragon, fluffy aragonite needle mud inside the ostracode and water above. And when cementation started, the crystals growing here in the lower part, they incorporated the needles, the ones on top, were massive and some crystals like this one are basically a typical calcite spar here in the upper part and a pitted microspar here in the lower part. And with this, with these glasses on our eyes, uh, we somehow we can re re reconstruct a different microspar story. This is one of my favorite pictures. Ignore this bright line here. This is a fuss of my pullover. So this is an artifact, it's not real but we see two shells or two fragments of shells in this picture. Here is a brachiopod shell, and here is a completely recrystallized, uh, primarily aragonitic shell. And I will, so, and there is some, oops, there is some sediment in between. Huh? So they are not directly in contact to each other. There are some space in between. And look at the crystals here. We see something like a preferred orientation and a random orientation here where there is no brachiopod shell above. And I will zoom in now in this part. And so here is our sediment. 
So this is this is our brachiopod shell sediment between the shell or space between the shells and our recrystallized aragonitic shell. And if we look carefully, we see that, for example, this crystal here is in the upper part is is a brachiopod prism. Here it is pitted microspar, and here it is recrystallized mollusk shell. So now it's just one crystal. And this one shows the same, this one shows the same, and so on. So these one crystal has three different uh, parts or histories. So how does it work? This is our brachiopod shell, our mollusk shell. So low magnesium calcite, aragonite, swimming or, or lying in a, in a mud that contains a lot of aragonite. The first step in diagenesis here was cementation. And these microspart crystals here in this case used the brachiopod prisms as seeds. So they continued from this, from this brachiopod prism and they just stopped here when they um, reached the, the um, aragonitic shell. The next step then is dissolution of aragonite, which means this shell will be dissolved and the aragonite needles will be dissolved. So we get our pitted microspar and here a, a moldic pore, a dissolved shell. And then we, uh, the uh, cementation continues. And this is what we see. One crystal is prism, pitted microspar and recrystallized shell all at once. Okay, so again, the picture. I have to look at it. Okay, yeah, I'm good in the time. So, of course, um, when diagenesis um, succeeds, continues, we can have uh, very deep burial conditions or even tectonic stress and so on. So eventually, the fossils will disappear. If you look carefully, you see a fossil here marked in yellow. I will remove it again. And this is hardly visible. It's, it's almost gone. If you just look at here at this part of the um, picture, it's, it's actually difficult to, to recognize. So, of course, finally, these, um, these crystals grow a little bit further on the expense of smaller ones. And this is the, the result. A typical microsporitic rock, if you just have this, is this really something like an experience and frustration. Now, what can you say if you have a rock like this? Just, well, it, it almost looks like a, a, a marble, just an order of magnitude smaller. Okay, so in, in my opinion, these, this model of folk does not work for microspar formation in these type of rocks. So I think it is not correct. I think it is, microspar is rather a cement somehow. So we start, with a, of an aragonitic needle mud full of water, different components uh, here, dolomite, for example, or clay minerals, a fossil, an empty fossil here in this case, so no aragonite needles inside. The first step is cementation, and this cementation continues until the soft sediment has been uh, transformed into a proper rock with all the aragonite needles inside and then they dissolve and we get our pitted microspar, sharp boundaries, the unpitted microspar or, or microsparite, if you want, inside the fossil where there were no aragonite needles. And then the, sh the shells uh, eventually disappeared <clears throat> due to ongoing um, diagenesis. So I'm, I'm almost done. So I have experienced or mentioned some problems of the folk model. And actually these, these problems are somehow solved. Folk, folk's model requires fresh water. Most of the pictures I have shown here, or, or maybe all of them, have never ever seen freshwater diagenesis, you know, the clinochore. So we, we, don't, so we don't require fresh water. This is something that happens without fresh water in pro most probably in the shallow marine burial realm in the poor water decoupled. So this is not a problem here. Chalk does not uh, recrystallize because it's a purely low magnesium calcitic um, mud, no aragonite. And what I have shown here is the transformation of aragonite containing sediments. The boundaries 
are sharp. This is not a problem here because this is basically expected. The cements, they grow until they reach the bioclasts or the components. The question is, where does all the cement come from? And this is actually a very interesting question. And I hope you remember the talk of Teresa because she said it comes from the marl. Folk recognized microspar is a typical feature of limestone marl alternations. And Teresa has shown very nice evidence that the marls have lost their aragonite. And this uh, provided the cement for the cementation of the carbonate. I will show one picture. That's, I think, is my last uh, figure. It shows the limestone marl alternation, which is laminated. And I will highlight the laminate slightly. I will go back and forth so you can try to follow the laminate yourself. And what you see is the marls are strongly compacted. The limestone here is a nodular one. This is more, uh, more sort of a bed. They are not compacted here. So this is early lithified. This has incorporated calcium carbonate cement and the marl has been compacted. So I, have, I hope that I have shown evidence that the limestone uh, or the, the limestones in limestone marl alternations are composed of microspar and microspar is a cement lithifying an aragonite containing mud. So if there was some aragonite here in the limestone and it's a laminated sediment, there must have been aragonite mud here as well. So in my opinion, the marls, they lost their ar aragonite if there are aragonitic shells, they are dissolved. If there's aragonitic mud, it's also dissolved. And this cements the, the limestone. Okay, that's it for, uh, for this talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm really looking forward to, to the questions. I think I have to stop uh, sharing the screen. Um, okay. So thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Axel. Um, I was just jotting down notes basically the whole time. So I really enjoyed it. If anybody has any questions, you can now type them into the chat. Um, please remember to let us know where you're watching from because it's just always interesting to see who joins us from around the world. Um, so while we wait for those, I have a couple of questions of my own. Um, oh, okay, <laughs> Rosalie has a question. So I'll save mine for a little bit later, I suppose. Um, Rosalie is coming from Cape Town and she says, thanks for a great talk, Axel. As a geochemist who aims to reconstruct primary seawater signatures in deep time, I'd love to hear your opinion on targeting the micrite components of carbonate rocks for analysis. Yes, using uh, micritic rocks for geochemistry, what we do have to keep in mind is that half of it is imported calcium carbonate. So even if it looks absolutely homogeneous, fine grain, perfect, half of it is incorporated calcium carbonate cement, which probably doesn't come from far away. It just comes from the nearby layers. So we might, might be able to use it. But for example, if we use, uh, let's say, boron isotopes for reconstructing seawater pH or whatever, I would not trust my critic rocks because what we would probably measure is the pH of the pore water, not the pH of the seawater. Agreed. That's um, definitely an interesting question. So just to sort of piggyback on Rosalie's question, do you think that there's any, um, let's say any hope in finding a depositional signature in those rocks or maybe with something like SIMS? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not a geochemist, but but for example, um, if you use stable carbon isotopes, for example, they are pretty close to the um, uh, to, to brachiopods or so. So this this will work, and and the carbon isotopes are not significantly changed because the pore water doesn't have a lot of carbon. It's just we dissolve aragonite, precipitate calcite. And in a more or less closed systems, we have made some mass balance calculations trying to check how closed it is. And it's surprisingly closed, in my opinion. So very little is, is lost. So there are some robust proxies, I would say. Mm -hmm. I would not really trust oxygen isotopes, for example, because the poor water has a lot of oxygen <laughs> by definition. Lot, yeah. But carbon isotopes, I think, would would work. A good option there. Okay, 
Um, so our next question is from Benoit Vincent from Eastern France. And they say, thanks for the nice talk. Many microspars are observed in pure limestones um, without any interbedded marls. Any idea of the source of fluids in that case? Um, yes, my, so my question would be if these, if these would be bedded, also bedded limestones, which means there is something between the beds and sometimes it's just uh, almost hardly a millimeter of, of, of anything in between. If mm -hmm. the rocks or if the sediment, like on the Bahamas, for example, is, is made of, let, or we can make a, a mental experiment. If it is 100% aragonite, what would happen to the, to the marls when they, in the marls, aragonite is dissolved, precipitating the limestone. If everything is aragonite, the marls are gone and we would end up with bedded limestones. Mm -hmm. So bedded limestones, would be the diagenetic result of a precursor sediment that is composed of basically nothing but aragonite. And this is the, an interesting observation in this respect is, at least to my experience, bedded limestones. If we have proper bedded limestone with hardly anything between the beds, the carbonate content of the limestones is always very close to 100%. At least I myself, I don't know an example of really bedded limestone with very thin interlayers or bedding planes, and let's say a carbonate content of 60 or 70%. I would be very interested in knowing of, of such sequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was mentioning that they're not bedded, that they're sort of more massive. Um, yeah, okay, this is, my, my whole yeah. talk was on these bedded, this is what folk recognized in his paper, saying that, that this is a, a very special feature of, of limestone marl alternation in its broadest sense. I was not, uh, talking about massive, massive. Reefs or other awesome. types of yeah. rocks. Um, okay, we have a next question from Maurice Tucker. Hi, Maurice. Um, he says, "Beautiful images, Axel. Much food for thought. In many of um, yours, in many of your images, it seems that the pits are more equant than um, acicular. Could it be that there was an equant precipitate first, like ACC, rather than needles?" That's a good question. Well, I had a long discussion also with, with Paul Wright because the, 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 this angular shape of the pits, I think they rather re reflect the, uh, the uh, crystallographic patterns of the microspar because they all show the same orientation. So it's, it's, uh, I don't think that they really mirror the, the shape of the needles. It's rather um, either produced by the etching process or uh, of these samples or, I don't know, over time developed? Mm. This is a good question. Yeah. Um, okay, our next question is coming from Rachel Wood. Um, is not the source of the cement from trapped seawater? No, I, I don't think it's... it's uh, well, this, this cement that is trapped in the seawater is just... It would be... It would, well, we, we could fill probably, I say, a per mil of the pore space with a trapped cement, and then we have to refuel our, our uh, pore water. And so we have to pre continuously provide cement, and the, the shallow marine burial zone is decoupled from the seawater. There's no, no way of pumping seawater, in my opinion, through a mud. It could provide, um, a, it could be a possibility for coarse-grained limestones, but not for mud. They are not not permeable enough. And we, we, we would have to flush thousands and thousands and thousands of volumes of, of seawater through the sediment in order to fill the pore space completely or almost completely. It would just be too much. Too much, okay. Um, so our next question, thank you for the great talk. You said that the cement comes from marls as dissolved aragonite. This means that the carbonate mud has to be associated with marls. What if it is not associated with marls? So I think similar question to the one beforehand. Yes, yeah, this, I think it's it's the 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 properties of the of the limestone marl alternation strongly depend on the aragonite content of the precursor sediment. So basically, the more aragonite is in the precursor sediments, the thicker are the limestones related to the marls at the end. Because mm -hmm. so if we have hardly any aragonite, we have to dissolve a thick marl in order to provide enough carbonate cement for a thin limestone layer. And if we have only aragonite, the aragonite, the marl is basically dissolved, marl in, in quotation marks, the marl is dissolved and we end up with bedded limestones. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. 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 The bed thickness and the carbonate content in limestone marl alternations they show a mathematical relationship. Or in other words, if you give me the the thickness of your limestones and marls in a regular succession and give me the carbonate content of the limestone, for example, I could predict the carbonate content of the marl, and it works surprisingly well. Oh, interesting. If somebody is interested, I could send papers. Just drop me an email. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Um, okay, so our next question is from Sangeeta, coming from Bombay, India. That was a nice talk. I've observed impure, crudely laminated limestone and marls having microspar, very similar to the um, images that you showed. The only difference being that they occur in a terrestrial setting of late, uh, late Triassic. So does it mean um, fresh water, or that would be interesting because this is one of the one of the many questions that we have is. Um, so we we have just published a paper of the Teresa Noel who who gave the talk uh, published a paper together with me showing that this sort of diagenesis uh, seems to occur also in brackish water settings. Mm -hmm. A big question is fresh water. Mm -hmm. The geochemistry yeah, uh, is, is is different. I would be interested to see. Uh, I, I really would love to to see some 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 pictures because uh, I don't have such uh, samples yet. Yeah, she did confirm um, that it is fresh water. So, um, okay. Sangeeta, but maybe you can email Axel and you guys can chat a little bit more. He can give you some references and you can send him some images. Yeah. Okay, so our next question comes from Noor. Um, he says, thank you for the great presentation. Oh, they're coming from Hungary. I'd like to ask about the assumption regarding groundwater fluctuations in case um, of the movement of magnesium ions to produce magnesium carbonate in Pleistocene, Holocene, non-marine carbonates. Hmm. Uh, groundwater fluctuations are not really involved in the story that I have presented because we are always at the fre phreatic zone. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, it's from Mohammed from Abu Dhabi. Thanks for the great talk. Just a note, not a question. We study carbonates from the Cretaceous and calcite seas, which luckily preserves its largely original porosity due to the low magnesium calcite mineralogy of the micrite. Interestingly, it was, if it was aragonite seas, this porosity is di diminished. Loss of porosity comes in the vicinity of stylolites and burial. So just a note. <laughs> yeah, this is, I, I, I sometimes had um, problems to get my, my stuff published because my original work was in the Salurian of Gotland, and that's really in the middle of a calcite sea. Mm -hmm. And we had some evidence that the mud contained a significant amount of aragonite. And, and several of the referees, they said, it's impossible. This is a calcite sea. This shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be the case. And now um, uh, Uwe Balthasar, who is, I don't know if he is uh, right now joining us or not, he just uh, published uh, a, a paper showing that it's not, it's not just the, um, the time, it's also the temperature. And this is also not, not, really, not only the magnesium calcium ratio, but also the temperature that determines the mineralogy. So it, it's really, it, it made my life easier because they, they were able to show that even in the strongest calcite sea, you can easily precipitate aragonite if the temperature is high enough which is the case on shallow water platforms or can be the case. Okay. Um, so our next question uh, is from Stefan Bodan. Hi, Stefan. Um, it's coming from Denmark. He wants to know why the aragonite only dissolved in marl layers first um, to then re-precipitate as calcite in the limestone beds and then aragonite in the limestone beds dissolved. So why is aragonite not uniformly dissolved in both the marl and the carbonate beds? Yeah, that's that's one of the fundamental questions, and I cannot really provide um, a really satisfying answer. The, what we observe is that we have six layers of aragonite dissolution and layers of calcite precipitation, and the boundary is sharp, and mm -hmm. it is 
it's a, sometimes within one single thin section. You might remember, I've done in Teresa's talk, I could also show uh, some, some figures here. I have them in the, in the PowerPoint. Yeah, she had that nice boundary within her thin sections. Yes. The transition. It's a really a sharp boundary. But the, 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 for me, the fundamental question is, if we have dissolution and precipitation zones, why is it rhythmic? If all the sediments, they go, go down continuously through all the zones, I would expect rather something like a diffuse cementation precipitation process. Mm -hmm. But this is not the case. Not uh, nowhere that I know of. So it's always something like a, a rhythmic process and what, what we need to produce rhythmic geochemical processes is a system that is not in thermodynamic equilibrium and we need a moving reaction front. Mm -hmm. The system is not in thermodynamic equilibrium because it contains aragonite, which is not stable. So we have an unstable situation and our reaction fronts are basically the, the bacterial zones in the pore water. But this has, if this is correct, it has far reaching consequences because it means even a sediment that doesn't show a rhythmic uh, alternation of, of A, B, A, B, A, B sediments would have, be, would have to be transformed somehow into a limestone marl alternation. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it does, but it's very difficult to prove. Okay, so we still have a few more questions here. So I'm gonna move on to our next one. Um, let's see, we have Hanan from Pakistan. Very nice and interactive talk. It'll help to amplify my sequence stratigraphy model for Eocene carbonate systems in the salt range. So just a comment. Mm -hmm. Lots of thank yous, lots of great talks, of course. Um, Stefan wants to know, what about rhythmic primary sedimentation patterns? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, this is, we should have combined this talk with, te with Teresa's. That's a, it's, it's a good question. What, what we do see sometimes in, in the field is that we have extremely different sediments combined in a single limestone layer. So it's, it's, I have shown a, a one a figure here in my, in my presentation showing that the same sediment, the lamination, the laminated one, the same sediment can be transformed into a marl and a few centimeters away into a limestone. So the mm -hmm. same sediment can be transformed to limestone and marl, there were no differences. It was a laminated sediment. There was there was it was just no change on the on, on the seafloor. And the same we can, or I could show figures showing the opposite, a limestone layer with mudstone, grainstone, packstone, and so on repeatedly on top of each other. These are the strongest differences that you can imagine, and they are still united in a single limestone layer under and overlain by an aragonite depleted marl. And this this makes our life hard because it's surprisingly difficult to prove the primary differences between the limestone and the marls, the, so the areas of dissolution. All the parameters that are affected or that are related somehow to carbonates, I would not use them because they are for sure diagenetically overprinted carbon isotopes, oxygen isotopes, magnesium, and so on. If we really want to prove what what, what were the original differences between limestones and marls, we have to rely on the um, parameters that are not affected by diagenesis. And there are not too many. What we could use, for example, is the titanium-aluminium ratio. Titanium-aluminium is completely bound to clay minerals. They are not affected during this early diagenetic carbonate redistribution. Mm -hmm. So we could measure aluminum-titanium ratio in a section and see whether or not limestones and marls show differences. If they do, it, and I know very few examples showing this, we are on the safe side. We have to, it's, it's a, an environmental cyclicity behind maybe Bilankovic, maybe something else, hard to say. The problem is if we don't see such differences, this makes our life hard because it could indicate that it's an entirely diagenetic rhythm or it could indicate that we have not measured the right parameters yet, or that there were primary differences, but in a parameter that is completely destroyed in diagenesis. Mm -hmm. For example, primary porosity, primary permeability, the amount of organic matter or something like this. The, the porosity we see today in the limestone and in the marl, they have nothing to do with the original porosity of the soft sediment. 
So we call this the diagenetic dilemma. If we don't see any proper differences, any diagenetically stable differences between these two rock types, it does not prove that it's a diagenetic rhythm. Mm -hmm. I would just say, be careful when you have, when you're working with rhythms, with uh, AB rhythms, limestones and marls, and you have, you're not able to determine any uh, reliable witnesses uh, with respect to the uh, precursor sediment. And it's, it's, it's really, it's, <laughs> it was not really the, the, the topic of this talk, but it's a very interesting topic actually. Yes, it sounds like there's still a lot to be done. Yes. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, we have Oscar from Marino uh, in Spain. He says, thanks for the nice talk. What would be the evolution of the microsporic te texture in the case that carbonate sediments would have reached several uh, kilometers of burial? and high burial temperatures accordingly. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And, and um, honestly, I don't know because I, I only worked on the early diagenetic processes. So I'm, we, what we do see is that, uh, for example, I've investigated some rocks from, from the Northern Calcareous Alps. And very often the fossils are almost gone, sometimes completely gone. So they will, will be overprinted. On the other hand, they, they they do not double their grain size or anything like this. I think this a grading neomorphism is something that takes place in, in this deep burial setting, but um, I don't know when it starts and how much it grows and so on. This is, would be a very interesting topic for a proper project. Yeah, how it develops in a deeper yes. depth. Yes. Um, okay, looks like maybe the last one. We have Sarah coming from Texas. Um, would you expect any differences in the process of microspar formation in the Proterozoic versus the Phanerozoic? Would the differences in vegetation and animal life have any influence? That's also a very good question. So we, we do see limestone marl alternations all over the Phanerozoic in very different settings from lagoon, so rubber boot water depth down to the slope, several hundred meters of water depth. I myself have not worked on, on um, pre-Cambrian limestone marl alternations. Uh, so I, I cannot really answer the question. I do know that they exist, but I think nobody has ever looked at I don't have samples. I have never seen them myself. Uh, it might be interesting to look at them with these glasses on the eyes. Mm -hmm. So I would be happy to, 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 to get some samples and to look at them. Also the freshwater, same thing. So we have, if we want to understand the system, we have to know where it ends. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. seems to be a process that happens during early marine burial diagenesis, but where is, where or how is the boundary towards the deeper freshwater or back in time? This is Absolutely. very, very interesting. And, and um, I'm sorry, but I, I don't yeah. really know the not, answer. Not the focus of this talk, but that just means um, everybody Please, and I'm just going to put this out there for you, Axel. Um, email Axel with uh, any other questions, and if you have um, some samples that you're interested in, or um, some further collaboration, also. Um, so, Axel, you sort of led me right into one of the questions that I had. I'll just ask you one of mine. Um, of course, I had a few, um, but for your sort of new, or I guess it was from your '97 paper, um, but new in terms of folk, um, that diagram that talks about the progression of the alteration from sort of the, the fluffy depositional um, aragonite mud to then the microspar and through all of the different stages. So I'm wondering if you can put that diagram with reference to diagenetic zones. So is basically everything past deposition in the marine burial zone So that's, that's also a very good question because the, um, we don't know yet where exactly it happens in the shallow marine mm -hmm. burial zone. And I had a long discussion with Paul Wright and with Teresa and other colleagues. The, a bit of the problem is that it's, we have a lot of information on, on, on marine diagenesis, on, on burial diagenesis. But this shallow marine burial uh, realm is the most poorly studied, studied realm for, and as for, for following reason. In the Pleistocene, we have a sea level drop. So everything that is shallower than 100 meters 
has been influenced by freshwater diagenesis. So we have to go into deeper water if we want to investigate the modern processes. And um, how to imagine we have a limestone cementing in, let's say, two meters depth, a proper limestone. We, how can we sample it in, in let's say, 150 meter water depth? Mm -hmm. A box core would just penetrate 60 centimeter. A gravity core would would go back as a banana to the ship because it, it is not able to penetrate the rock. A proper drill core would just bring bits and pieces back because this solid rock is under and overlain still by very, very soft marls, which are not compacted yet in two meters depth, in, as, just as a number. So this is a... That's the reason why this, this um, diagenetic processes are really understudied completely. And maybe, maybe it's wrong, I don't know, but we have to uh, figure it out. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting, especially looking at the different zones. You know, you were showing some of the zones in terms of metabolic activity and breakdown of organics and how yeah. those different metabolisms can lead to different processes. And so I'm just curious also about and how to tie those in. And, and, and funny have... enough, one, one of the zones in the diagram that I have shown, which uh, is, is even missing, and I think it's a very important one, it's between the sulfate reduction zone and the zone of methane production, there is this uh, thin zone of anaerobic oxidation of methane, which is where the pore water is characterized by relatively high alkalinity. And I think my, my gut's feeling is that this zone plays an important role, but it's just my feeling. I've never... I, I, Sure. I haven't checked yeah. it yet. Okay, well, wow, what um, a diverse range of questions and a really great talk. Thank you again, Axel, for joining us today. And thank you everybody else for joining us online. And please come back next week where we will have Jesus Perez, who's gonna talk to us about the ecology of carbonate drifts. And we will see you then.